Hello my favourite Year 10 pupils, this is Mr Sumner here and I'm just going through the week's work beginning May the 18th 2020. So retrieval from previous week, um, a retrieval quiz on poetic terms that's now up on forms which looks like this. I know forms was being a bit fiddly this morning, I think it sort of crashed um, across the whole system for Microsoft so we had some issues with some wider things earlier. It should be working and it should have accepted answers correctly from now on so I hope that's now the case. In terms of new work, we're going to be working on William Blake's poem London this week. I'd like you to do some annotation, what I call sort of poem crunching around it, um, some one sheet revision work on it, and then 200 challenge question, which is um, an extension only. Just in terms of where I put this in Teams, this is all there. So because there's four things, it probably looks like a bit more work than it actually is, but each task is pretty self contained and I think pretty clear. And the one page revision, I'd recommend doing this at the end of the week. So I think what would be a good idea is to do the context work, the annotating and crunching work um, and the retrieval practice. I would do that all first and then the one page revision I'd actually save to um, Friday or Saturday and Sunday if you're using the weekends for work as well. But don't do that all at the same time. Even if there's a temptation to try and get everything done, um, I think it's useful to give yourself a bit of space. And each week with each poem, I'll be giving you one of these uh, one page revision tasks that you'll be doing. And again, those resources have been prepared um, by some excellent English teachers who I've been using resources from from Twitter, a man called Stuart Pryke, so I want to give credit where credit's due. But I just think that's a really, really useful thing for you to be doing. So going back to the, the structure of this week's work, um, a 200 word challenge question, that's an extension only, and that's only if you want to have a go at that. Um, if you've reached the stage of, of boredom or, or intellectual determination, you want to move on with things and all instructions are go for schools and uh, we put the work in assignments. So London by Blake. Now, just thinking about this, what I'd like you to do now is, is pause the video for two or three minutes and just have a look at this picture and think about the things you see. It's a picture by the 18th century painter and satirist William Hogarth known as Gin Alley. And having unpaused it, then have a think further on and with this slide, start to think about which specific things can you pick out, which images do we have. So when you look at things more closely, you see this macabre figure here. Um, he's almost skeletal, isn't he? The way you can see his bones and his exhaustion, his starvation. Over here at the background, we have um, the sign of a coffin. Um, again, so, you know, just in terms of the nature of industry in that area, up here we have a hanged man, uh, sort of appallingly, again, bleak and dark image. Over here we have ostensibly a surgeon, you can see the surgeon's saw there. Um, here various alarming figures, here are um, a woman so inebriated, you know, covered in sores on her legs and the, her infant child are uh, falling away from her due to her carelessness. So it's a pretty bleak picture of London that's portrayed in Gin Alley. And again, I think the more you look at the detail, the more you see beneath the surface. So things to be thinking about with Blake is what is he saying about London, how is he presenting it and why is he presenting it in this particular way. So the first thing I've asked you to do is look at this key information and answer these questions before. This is on a Word document which then looks like this and here is the key information. Um, again he was from a humble background, he's considered a seminal figure in this period of the Romantic Age because as well as being a poet he was also um, philosophically um, very much a romantic. He created his own versions of religions and his own adaptations of um, of the Bible and holy books. He wrote a sort of you know large piece called for the Four Zoas. He creates a kind of god figure in his work called Urizen, which is a pun on both horizon and your reason. And he illustrated the works himself in these remarkable copper plate etchings. So he's a very very unusual and unconventional figure, and. It's interesting that such a figure like that is now on our syllabus, is now within um, the orthodoxy, because it isn't Blake, something Blake himself would recognise, um, though he did work with the Royal Academy, which is you know, the most conventional form of, of art there as well. So I think the other thing to always think about with these kind of revolutionary figures is, is to what extent are they revolutionary, you know, how much are they willing to fit within the system to promote their own ideas. Um, again, I think this is just useful phrasing and some useful thoughts to think about and phrasings and word phrases in terms of how you write about poetry or indeed any text and just in terms of you know alternative ways of looking at things, thinking about symbolism, um, picking on particular words and exploring them, 
comparing to other poems, thinking about changes of tempo and pace in a poem. It's all really, really helpful stuff. Now, think about the five big ideas in Blake's poem. So as you read through it, um, thinking about the tone of this, so just to read through it once for you. I wander through each chartered street, near where the chartered Thames does flow, and mark in every face I meet marks of weakness, marks of woe. In every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every ban, the mind-forged manacles I hear. How the chimney-sweepers cry, every blackening church appalls, and the hapless soldier's sigh runs in blood down palace walls. But most through midnight streets I hear how the youthful harlots curse, blasts the newborn infant's tear, and blights with plagues the marriage hearse. So what you have here then is a, is a poem about someone this is a very kind of classic literary device, isn't it, where you have a character wandering through an area and they're effectively recording what they're seeing. So as you can hear, you know, Blake is marking in every face he meets and then punning on the word mark, marks of weakness, marks of woe, which means sadness. Um, his initial reaction to the chartered streets, the chartered Thames, they've been owned, they've been mapped. They're no longer free and romantic in the spirit that Blake would like. And here we have again further observations and, and look at how the sense are used so here obviously the eyes and here the ears um, and we go back again to combining the two the cry of the chimney sweepers and the blackening church appalls um, blackening with the pollution of the nascent industrial revolution and again what you see I think really beautifully here is that here you have this uh, very visual imagery then you have this very auditory imagery and then across here how it combines. Now where this is emphasised is actually the the emphatic imagery here is going to be the auditory because it goes visual, auditory, a combination of the two, the chimney sweeper's cry, the hapless soldier's sigh and again even the rhyme scheme works it out here that the two auditory ones cry and sigh go together and the two visual ones blackening church pools and blood down palace walls go together but the emphasis finally is on the auditory and therefore it's appropriate that for Blake a poet as much as an artist um, in a poetic form he, he finalises on this version that he talks about this particular version of things. Um, blast the newborn infant's tear so a youthful harlot um, and blights with plagues the marriage hearse so here this sort of oxymoron of marriage and hearse combined together all really interesting stuff. As you go through the presentation, this isn't things to send back to me, but these are just for your own information. Just pulling out these particular things in terms of vocabulary and appearance, I think would be very, very useful to do. And again, it's a very similar process here, thinking about the nature of government, um, some useful poetic terms there. I've done the same for the third one and finally for the fourth. So when you look at the structure as you annotate, Again, an A, B, A, B rhyme scheme. So street is rhyme A, meat is rhyme A, flow is B, woe is B. Man is then a new rhyme, C, rhymes with band, C, fear and hear, D, D, etc, etc, etc. So four verses, four lines each. So what we call a quatrain. Why are things of such similarity in length? Why is it so orderly, particularly when you consider the violence of the description being talked about here. And then think about here, what's Blake's purpose? Why might he have written this poem? So again, you don't need to send these back to me, but just for your own information, why Blake might have written the poem? To criticise the society around him, to teach people about the dangers of things, to celebrate the diversity and, and sort of vivid, visceral life of London. All those sort of things would be worthy ideas. And then keep on coming back to these three big questions again, you don't need a written answer for these three things, but I think it's really important you keep on thinking about them the whole time. Now, in terms of the activities I've attached for you to work on, um, the first one is to support you with annotating the poem. Sort of what we're saying, find it, highlight it, annotate it. Think about these particular things. Um, you know, what does the word blood make you think of? Highlight the word curse. If someone curses, what are they doing? All those kind of things. So those are kind of ways of zooming in of the poem and its structure. The second thing that I've asked you to sort of crunch into, and this I think is an interesting thing, so reducing each line of the poem to one key word. And again, um, you know, which do you want to use in this first one is the I, that we've got a first person narrator. 
more important than, say, Chartered? Or would you want to use Chartered for one or two to really emphasise the world that Blake is describing? And then I think transform into an image to help you remember it. And I think this is particularly important with Blake's poetry because of the way that Blake himself worked. Because if we look at Blake's own imagistic poetry, when you look at how Blake presented things, so here is an example of what Blake's um, copy of Songs of Innocence and Experience, this poem is from Songs of Experience, look like. And here is London um, itself in all its kind of vivid glory. I think it actually looks better there. And you can see um, the kind of writing it does, this sort of wonderful handwritten style, this elderly figure being led through the streets like a child. Is that the eye of the story being wandering through its chartered street? And again, this strange kind of organic thing um, over here, almost like a pod. It's very difficult to see in Blake's imagistic world very specific, real things. So again, it's really worth having a look at the kind of imagery Blake creates because it's really interesting and really unusual and beautiful. So these are all the key things to be thinking about whilst you're working on these particular areas. So the last thing that I want you to do this week is the one sheet revision task. And again, as I've said earlier, I know I'm going on about this, but I would really recommend doing this at the end of the week and therefore um, and actually trying to do it without referencing any other notes you've created so summarizing what the poem is about in full sentences and again that's a really sort of helpful thing and this pulls together the information that you've been working on and then this final question how does Blake present the abuse of power in London again not looking for a detailed you know hugely substantial answer um, in terms of you know writing length, think about say an eight mark question for language paper one or two. It's that sort of length and detail. We're not looking at this as a full thirty mark question for the literature paper two. This is a sort of um, fifteen to twenty minute writing task. Thinking about the abuse of power. If you wish to do any further research on context, that would be a helpful helpful thing, and I think that would be a useful thing for you to think about. So this is the last thing you should be doing. But again, I would very strongly recommend that you do this at the end of the week. OK, thank you very much for listening, Year 10. I hope you're all really well. I look forward to catching up with you later um, this week when we do a Q&A catch up. And I hope everyone's well. And thank you for continuing to be so good communicating, sending in some fantastic work. Um, I'm, I continue to be hugely impressed by everything you're doing. OK, well done, everyone, and speak to you soon. Bye.